So some of you might have been present last week. We did lower limb assessment, which obviously is part of a holistic leg ulcer assessment. Um, but this bit moves on to right what now? So if you've got a diagnosis, you've done your assessment, you've come up with a the, the, this an etiology, you know it's venous, what, what do I do? What's the treatment plan? So really just a couple of stats for you. We know that lower limb wounds account for pretty much nearly 50% of all wounds in the UK. There's been a couple of big studies over the last five years that's uh, given us that evidence. And it's leg ulcers that may, many people in the UK are affected. Um, and it accounts for about 34% of the total wound population. Um, you've possibly seen these figures because they're so horrendous and I know TV in various sort of sessions have, have mentioned these costs. But, you know, wound care per se in the UK is massive in terms of costs, sort of up to £5.1 billion. Pounds. But, um, you know, lower limb wounds will account for most of that. And in fact, since the original study was done back in about 2012, uh, they reckon this has been this massive increase, um, you know, of about or at least tripled the amount of costs associated with, with leg ulcer care. Um, so this is why NHS England are currently doing a big piece of work on lower limb care. It's part of a national strategy which was meant to be launched back in March, but of course, because of COVID, it was put on hold. Uh, there is um, hopefully the intention to try and roll out this work um, probably in the autumn. And um, that will be very much around using pathways again. And there's some really good guidance uh, that goes with that. And it will be very much focused on sort of early intervention to stop these leg ulcers becoming a problem long term. So, as I said, leg, venous leg ulcers are the most common leg ulcer um, that people will experience. And around about 70% of patients will have a venous problem. Um, mainly, it's it, you then get people who have this mixed etiology, so their main problem is venous, but they've got some arterial component that's impacting on healing potential, maybe. But the majority will have a venous leg ulcer, and that's Pretty good news, not for the patient, but actually that means that we can do something about it. It should be fairly easy to resolve. Um, about three quarters of people should heal within 12 months, but actually two thirds should heal within six months. And those of you that have been around a little while and uh, are used to our leg ulcer pathways, as you know, they're based on a 24 week healing rate, which is about six months time six month period, isn't it? So we should be aiming for that. And the recommended treatment, you know, wound care aside, because I know a lot of people get quite sort of hung up about dressings, but the main focus should be on strong compression. And what I mean by that is full compression. So our Actico, our, our K2, and there's a big move now for what we call endovenous ablation surgery. So some of you might have had patients that have had sclerotherapy, which is like a foam therapy into the vein to get rid of the dodgy veins. But there's a lot of laser um, therapy and it, that's how they are ablated as well. And that will be very much part of the new strategy from NHS England that routinely patients with a venous leg ulcer whether they're healing or not, should be referred to vascular for um, ablation of their faulty veins. And that will come out in revised sort of guidelines from tissue viability in time. So we've, you know, we've talked about how much it costs and obviously, you know, it impacts massively on your caseload. You know, if you think about community nursing, up to 50% of your workload is wounds and a lot of that is leg ulcers. Uh, but, you know, what about the patient? We know that living with a leg ulcer is absolutely miserable for patients. You know, they have the most terrible pain. They're living with smell and wet dressings and leaking onto their bed linen. You know, it starts to impact on their mobility, the pain in their leg, the swelling in their legs, having to wear bandages impacts on mobility and as you know people who become less mobile then it's a knock-on effect um, uh, in, in sort of exacerbating disability. 
living with all that, as you can imagine, it does increase levels of depression and anxiety. And if you were to test your patients, the chances are they'd be scoring higher scores on that depression scale. And often that goes undiagnosed and um, people are just maybe thought of as being a bit low in mood or a bit grumpy sometimes. But, you know, that concordance issue is often associated with anxiety and depression as well. People don't sleep because of the pain in their legs. And as you know, we need good, good night's sleep for healing. Um, and, that, and the knock on effect of that when they're tired, they don't want to exercise, you don't want to eat. So you can imagine it's sort of how it mushrooms, really. And these people often become quite socially isolated as well um, for a number of reasons, uh, including, you know, when there's malodor in the house, people have told me that friends stop visiting and also they can't get out to the shops anymore because of their mobility problems. And, you know, we're talking often here around older people, but there are a lot more younger people now who have leg ulcers who need to work and the financial impact of that as well. So we mustn't forget uh, how this affects our patients. So we know that healing rates can be improved by using a sort of systematic or a pathway type approach to care. And this should be based on your holistic um, leg ulcer ass assessment, getting the diagnosis right. Because if you don't get a proper etiology, how do you know which pathway to use, which path to go down to treat your patient effectively. And really importantly, we need to be developing a really robust sort of holistic approach to this and developing a really good partnership with our patients uh, and consider maybe a shared care model of care. Sometimes, you know, we automatically think that we should be delivering that care, but certainly COVID has taught us that a lot of patients, either themselves or their relatives with help from relatives, can embark on a treatment plan, plan independently. But of course, you need to be advising on the, on, on the therapy to ensure that things are going in the right direction. The pathway should also include a really good pain management plan. We'll come on to all these. One around skin care, uh, wound care, strong compression, the importance of reassessment to make sure that what you've embarked on in terms of a plan is progressing as you hope it should, you know, as it should be. And then also about early referrals. So not holding on to these patients if things aren't progressing, um, you know, getting in touch with tissue viability sooner rather than later. And also it goes along the line of a vascular uh, assessment as well. So referral to vascular for a duplex scan. So this holistic approach or this partnership you know, we, we talk a lot or we, we think, don't we, around the need to, for having that sort of empathetic or compassionate uh, approach to our care. And as nurses, that should should be the case. You know, we haven't even got to think about it. We, that's how we should be approaching our, our care. But sometimes when we're busy, we sometimes forget or we're coming across as maybe not being as compassionate, as empathetic as we can be. And a lot of that is down to we don't listen properly and we can't really be that empathetic about what patients are experiencing unless we're listening to them properly. So we, we've you've probably um, done touched on the, the motivational interviewing stuff. Penny and our team has done a lot around that. But using that sort of approach um, will help build a better relationship with your patient, uh, which makes them happier about the treatment plan. But also it will improve things like concordance as well. Patient education is really important because unless patients can understand what their condition is, they're possibly going to be reluctant to work with you on a plan. And that's really important because sometimes when you're talking about maybe applying full compression, if they don't understand what's going on with their veins and how compression works, they might be reluctant to do that. I would start talking to your patients about their condition being a disease rather than just, oh, it's a leg ulcer. Because it is a disease and I think patients are more likely to listen and embark on a plan if you're talking about it in that sort of terms, rather than just calling it a leg ulcer, which they think, well, old people get leg ulcers and they, that's not necessarily the case. So educate um, is education is really important. And if 
you you should be aware of the Legs Matter campaign, um, their website has got huge amounts of resources on their patient section of their website. Signpost to that because it is brilliant for, for information. Uh, even if you know they can go and dip into that sort of after you've left them and just leave them the, the link to the website. And also having an, a flexible approach to your treatment options. So, you know, we're pretty clear about, you know, certain compression um, modalities and, you know, what, what we would recommend on a pathway. But if you've got a patient who's going to be reluctant to maybe go down a bandage route, um, you know, first line should be considering things like hosiery kits. Footwear is an issue, isn't it? So what could you do to make it easier for the patient to get their shoes on? Um, sometimes we have to meet a patient halfway, first of all, to be a little bit flexible in our, because it's meant to be individualised care, isn't it? So sometimes we have to be quite creative about sort of, you know, our plan to make sure it fits with that patient so you get sort of complete buy-in really to, to what you're hopefully going to achieve. So pain management really needs to be at the top of your list as part of your pathway, because if you don't get on top of the pain, sometimes you're going to be uh, up against it, really, when patients are considering the options around compression. And sometimes when you're discussing what your treatment objective would be, forget about healing at this point, because if they've got pain, addressing the pain should be one of the first things that you're doing. Uh, and I would have thought that would be higher on the patient's list of priorities than healing at this point. So it's important that you do a pain assessment and really get to the bottom of what sort of pain that patient is experiencing. Is it no susceptive pain, normal pain, or is it more neuropathic in nature? So sort of those nervy sort of um, descriptors that a patient might be giving you. Because the medication that we use is very different for nociceptive and neuropathic. So if it's neuropathic, you should be considering things like amitriptyline or pregabalin, gabapentin. But you need to really try and identify what is causing the pain. So there usually is a reason why people have got pain. And often with a venous, with venous disease, it's often associated with oedema. So you've got that sort of very congested limb. It's very tight and painful. And we know that that pain will reduce dramatically and pretty quickly once you get full compression on. But obviously you're having to convince your patient that that's what the problem is and to, you know, hope, put trust in you, have faith in you that once that bandage goes on, their pain should reduce. Pain can also be associated with infection. So again, oh, no presentation showing. Is this right? Can anyone... I can what? see it, Sarah. All oh, right, pen, pen, or oh, uh, I've not been able to see, see anything for a while. I can see it. Oh, good. Okay, it may. I think last week actually most people saw it, but there was one or two. So as long as the majority of you are seeing it, I'm happy with that. So, um, uh, infection can be a reason for for pain as well. So you'll be assessing for that inflammation, but of course, ischemia. So lack of blood supply can be a significant reason for pain. And it's usually associated with that crampiness. Um, but I'd like to think if you if you've got to this point and you think people have got a venous leg ulcer, ischemia shouldn't be um, the the sometimes if you open your video and click on it. OK, right. Um, when you're thinking about an analgesia plan, obviously plan that with the GP and your patient, but also think beyond um, uh, sort of pharmacological type of interventions. So, you know, diversional therapy, distraction therapy. I often sort of talk to patients about, you know, wh what do you enjoy doing? What will take your mind off it? Is there a particular, you know, music or a book or art therapy or there's things like distraction therapy? Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, where you can um, mindfulness, that sort of stuff. And, you know, some people it's a bit touchy feely, but it does work for some people. Um, you know, having a phone call with a friend to catch up or things like that, really. So, so I think it's important that we don't just focus purely on analgesia in terms of medication, 
patients need to start looking at strategies for managing their pain um, themselves as well. Having that empathetic approach is really important, you know, understanding and 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 sort of trying to put yourself in that patient's shoes as to what they're experiencing um, is quite powerful really but don't forget refer um, GP should be aware of pain as a problem and there are other resources just pain clinic that maybe can help as well so um skin care uh, that is the next bit of the pathway and sometimes that's forgotten. Don't forget the skin is an organ and if this starts to fail, it can lead to complications um, in your plan. So, um, you know, there's a picture on the screen here of hyperkeratosis. You know, that's essential that that is removed. It harbours bacteria and fungi underneath it and it's a source for inflammation and infection like cellulitis and patients will scratch, it's itchy, and that they will then get further trauma and that can lead to more complications. So bowl washing, certainly with a limb like this is essential, um, or if patients can shower, they can shower using an emollient as a soap substitute, but we need to be working on, get a flannel, get patients to use good old fashioned flannels um, and using circular motions to try and lift off some of those plaques. They should have been softened with a very greasy emollient beforehand and that will help lift them off. I mean, something as extensive as that isn't going to come off in the first session. It's going to be over, a, you know, probably a couple of weeks, I would imagine. Take, you know, pay attention to between the toes, any skin folds or etc. Um, but we need to start improving that skin health. So treat any infection so if you think there is a fungal infection there you need to get treatment for that uh, and also if the patient is um, presenting with varicose eczema that could be a mild um, condition that's just based on an itch to full-blown wet weeping eczema which you might have seen and of course the treatment for those two sort of ends of the spectrum is very different from uh, just maybe um, an emollient and improving the skin through an emollient to pot permanganate soak steroid for two weeks, stepping down to a, a reduced. We have got resources on our internet site around um, the management of, of, of using things like pot permanganate, but people will need to have a steroid on their skin if they're presenting with an acute eczema like that. Um, emollient therapy, and that is not just for this active treatment, we should be encouraging that anyway long term. Um, and as I said, a greasy uh, an ointment for, for dry skin such as hyperkeratosis or a cream. And either of them can be used in the water as a soap substitute. Care of the peri wound skin, so if you've got a very wet ulcer, uh, um, we um, you, you know, you might find you might need to use something like um, a barrier film temporarily if there's a lot of sort of maceration or excoriation around the wound. But I, I, I do find that once you've introduced your compression and you've got a good absorbent pad on there uh, and you've got emollients up to the edges, that can often be enough. But if you've assessed that skin as being at risk, you can use a skin barrier film, the lollipops, the one mil lollipops uh, as a short term measure. And of course, make sure your patients are well hydrated and uh, nourished as well, because that can improve the skin health. So then we go on to wound care and a wound is a wound, whether it's a leg ulcer or a pressure ulcer or whatever. But the important bit of the pathway for a venous leg ulcer is the removal of devitalized tissue, uh, management of infection, exudate management, protecting that new granulation tissue and then also any epithelial tissue that's migrating from the edges or any little islands in between. So devitalized tissue that can present as sort of thinnish slough, thickish, thickish slough. Um, there shouldn't be necrotic tissue in a venous leg ulcer that is associated with ischemia unless it's something like a martoral ulcer which people might develop if they have unmanaged hypertension. But the majority of venous ulcers, they should not have um, necrotic tissue in there. Occasionally, if you've got thickish slough, 
and you have anaerobic infection, it can present as like black sooty deposits over the slough and some people do mistake that for necrosis. So just make sure that you're, you are sure of what you're looking at. So in terms of our pathway, if the slough is sort of thinnish and not infected, it's just, you know, sort of, uh, it can also be sort of fib fib fibrotic tissue that's that's forming. Um, just go with good bowl washing, using some gauze to gently sweep the wound bed. Um, and our debridement dressing would be Ergo Clean. Now we are using Deborah Soft. Um, if you if, if that slough is stubborn, I would advocate the use of Deborah Soft. Don't put an emollient on it. Use it in just fresh water. You dampen the, the, the they say an egg cup full, um, but you don't have an egg cup on you, obviously. Um, and then just apply gentle pressure to the wound bed and using a circular motion, you then start to wipe the wound, rub the wound bed. And that is meant to be lifting off that sluffy tissue. It can be uncomfortable for the patient. It can trigger some bleeding points if the wound is inflammatory. So just warn the patient about that. And you might need to use one or two applications over a consecutive um, uh, visits before that starts to lift off. And then you would put your ergo clean on the top of that. If the tissue is infected, again, you'd be cleansing. You would definitely use the, the Deborah Soft and then you follow it on with um, an antimicrobial and we would say honey because that is a great debrider. And if you have a mucky looking leg also like this one in the um, picture, uh, I would go for something like Algavon. It's got it's an alginate with honey in it. Just using Actilite is not enough. Uh, these ulcers tend to need something a bit more meaty. But we need to get that devitalized tissue out of the wound bed because it causes inflammatory processes and proteases go up and that delays healing. You want a nice clean wound bed. So management of wound infection. So this actually is a perfect example of, this actually was a guy who had a martoral ulcer, so hence the necrotic tissue, in case you're thinking why she put a picture like that up and this is venous leg ulcers. But this is also an infected leg. It's, it's the exudate was so high that this eroded down onto the foot. So um, you should be using the Amble tool to assess for infection, but mainly, you know, use your eyes. It's pretty evident, isn't it? So you've got increased levels of exudate, you've got maloda, you'll have maybe some um, green sluffy tissue in the wound bed, that pain levels have gone up. So these are all signs of local wound infection. Um, so select an antimicrobial based on the wound presentation. <coughs> and as I said, you know, Algavon is often a good one for these sort of mucky leg ulcers. Um, Try and use it as first line. I know it can be stingy for some patients, but we do have the leaflets. Uh, I don't know if you're still using them, but it's a great leaflet that we produced for patients on the use of honey uh, and get them to take some analgesia beforehand before you put it on because it's a very natural product and it's a sort of multifaceted antimicrobial um, and it is really good for debridement. Use the Deborah Soft prior to starting your antimicrobial and we use that the antimicrobial for about two weeks and then review. If you feel that it isn't progressing and there's still evidence of infection in there, do seek advice from tissue viability. It could be that you need to continue with that treatment for another couple of weeks or we might suggest that you swap to a different antimicrobial. Don't forget, oral antibiotics are only for systemic infection if patients have a cellulitis or host reaction, they're unwell, et cetera, et cetera. Exudate management, there is an exudate pathway you can refer to, and there's some guidance coming out um, hopefully this week from the uh, matrons team um, around sort of um, the use also of, of, of Sorbion. So, um, look out for that. But use the exudate pathway and think about why, if the levels of exudate are high, why they are high. It's often associated with oedema, but it could be infection. Um, it could be that actually the patients are, um, they, they should be in compression and they're not, or they're not in adequate compression. So select your absorbent 
stressing based on that assessment. So is it low extra date, moderate or high? And think again about that peri wound skin. Does it need protecting at this stage or are you confident that once you get the compression on and your absorbent pad that that will be fine? And um, so, so the barrier films shouldn't be a default. Uh, we see a lot of it out there uh, inappropriately used. So then we're thinking about part of the pathway is the protect and progress. OK, so you've you've cleaned up the wound. It's beautiful and healthy. Um, so what do you put as as a contact layer? So you want to be protecting any newly formed granulation tissue. So keep it simple, folks. A trauma, trichotex for venous leg ulcers. That's all you need with your secondary pad and your compression. And what we would suggest that if the wound is less than three months old, it's a younger wound, just use atrauma and trichotex. But if they're older wounds, they're greater than three months old. If you if you think about the pathway that we've got, we are suggesting you use ergo start contact. And if you could just make sure that it is contact, you need to make sure that that is on the prescription. So this will be FP10, whereas the other stuff you get from OMPOS. Um, if you don't put contact, you'll end up with a foam version and that doesn't manage the extra date as well as we would like it to. So this is the protease inhibitor. So it inhibits the overproduction of these harmful, um, they're like a protein, an enzyme that can keep the wound in an inflammatory status. Um, and you often get this with these very older wounds. So what this dressing does is it inhibits this overproduction and it allows that wound to start to progress into proliferation, so that granular stage. And um, we have been using it for, six, for 12 weeks maximum in the past, but the new guidelines that I'm drafting is going to be based on four weekly reassessments, so we would be using this for eight weeks that will be coming out to you. So don't worry about that at the moment. So then, you know, don't forget about that lovely, wonderful, I'm sure you love seeing it, that epithelial tissue that you'll see at the edges. Um, it's, it's a sort of darker, pinky, smooth tissue, isn't it? Um, and that is real evidence that healing is on its way. So it predominantly comes from the edges and it will sort of migrate in. But you might see it in the centre of the wound where the epithelial cells will form from hair follicles and you get little islands. So and they can present at first as sort of little white islands and then they turn sort of pinky. They're very fragile at this stage, so you need to love them and protect them. And what you might find happens is you get a build up around a wound of sort of wound debris and old eschar. And that can inhibit the uh, migration of these cells. So again, soaking the leg, gently removing that with emollients. Um, if it doesn't come off with a gentle sort of tug, don't force it because it'll make it bleed. It'll come off when it's ready. But you should be keeping the edges nice and clean to allow those migrating cells to, to move across the wound. Um, you don't want the, the wound too wet or too dry. If it's too dry, the epithelial cells won't migrate. If it's too wet, they drown and, and come away. So it's getting that balance right um, uh, underneath the, the, the dressings, that nice microclimate for the wound. And you can take out emollients right to the edges of the wound and that will help soften those plaques as well. Strong compression, and what we mean by that is we talk about full compression. So this is a venous leg ulcer, so they need to be in full compression. And we've talked a lot about this lately, and I'm not going to go into any detail about compression in this session because Penny's doing a whole session next week on the fundamentals of compression. But it needs to be applied correctly to get that therapeutic benefit. So as it describes on the tin, how you apply it, that's how it should be done. So Actico, unless you have a bead of sweat on your forehead, you haven't applied it correctly because you need to give it that full stretch. Um, and if there is a little bit of edema there in the foot, you need to be putting some squeeze on that as well. I'm not going to go into sort of different sizes because we're now talking about the chronic edema pathway. We're talking about standard shaped venous leg also limb here. So you'd be using Actico 10 centimetre on that limb. There's also K2 
And um, don't forget, there's two sizes. There's the 18 to 25 and the 25 to 32. So make sure that you've measured your patient's ankle to ensure they're in the correct size. Otherwise, you won't be delivering the correct amount of compression. You shouldn't be putting reduced compression on these patients. Um, sometimes you do that because you are a bit nervous in case you've got it wrong. You need to tell yourself, I haven't got it wrong. I am a goddess or a god. I know what I'm doing. I need to be putting full compression on. So avoid reduced. You're not doing your patients any favours. And when your patients say, oh, nurse, just slack it off a bit, not too tight. Take it off, leave it off until you can convince them that they need full compression because it's otherwise a very expensive retention bandage and you're not going to be getting them healed. So consider your skills and get some support if you feel you need. There's plenty of support around for bandage training. And don't forget, we should be considering leg ulcer hosiery kits as first lines, particularly if they're smaller ulcers. And the NHS England guidance will be suggesting that as well. And the great thing about that is that you can then often maybe not with some old people to manage their own leg ulcers but family members possibly could could help with that it's easy to get on and you're going to get your standardized compression if you've measured them for the right size um other modalities are available you know there's a lot of wraps around at the moment but to tell you the truth for venous leg ulcer treatment at the moment the default should be a leg ulcer hosiery kit or compression bandaging but if they don't fit your patient's needs, talk to us and we will discuss other modalities for you. Just want to mention wool at this point, even though I'm sure Penny will mention it next week. I see sometimes three rolls of wool under Actico. Stop it now, please, because what will happen is that it changes the size of the limb so your compression won't be as therapeutic but also what happens is your bandages will slip because there's so much wool and it's also very hot for the patient so minimal wool it's it's covering the limb if need be put a strip down the ankle um, down the tibial plateau some around the ankle uh, but when you've got patients who are struggling to get shoes on um you know, maybe we need to think about less wool on the foot or sometimes no wool on the foot, being a bit maverick now. So reassess and refer. Um, really, once you've got that plan in place, that pathway in place, it's not just that, that's it now. You need to be monitoring the impact of what you're doing, okay? Um, but formally, at four weeks, you should be doing that wound measurement again, uh, and just completely formally reviewing your plan. So at four weeks, we should be expecting a 40% reduction of that surface area that you did as part of your assessment. You know, if it's 30%, brilliant, well done. But if it's 10%, there's a problem. And I would suggest at that point, as per pathway, you should be referring to tissue viability at that point to allow us to sort of help you uh, to look at what, what the barriers are to healing. If this is a pure venous leg ulcer, it should be progressing uh, at four weeks very nicely. And aim for complete healing at 24 weeks as well. So aftercare, um, you know, you've now got them healed well within the 24 weeks. Um, I just wanted to add this at the end is that uh, have the conversations with your patient about longer term hosiery sooner rather than later because often when the, you get them healed uh, and now you're talking about hosiery they look at you in horror because they think well i've healed now so why are you telling me i need hosiery so again it goes back to them understanding their underlying condition and the need to to have some ongoing compression so uh, they need to be going into a compression hose whatever that is whether it's full length or, or below knee and you need to be educating around skin care ongoing skin care and the old education around mobility, exercise, nutrition, all of the things that you would have done during your active treatment plan, going to bed, elevating your legs, doing your exercises, walking short distances, all of those things should continue uh, as well as that happening during their, their, their treatment plan. Um, and the importance of really keeping an eye on their legs and 
early intervention if if it starts to break down or if they get an injury. So advise them against germaline and elastoplast for six weeks before they contact you. Tell them to contact you sooner rather than later. And the need for follow up for remeasurement of um, hosiery and redopplering. So that is a little well, it is it's a it's a leap through management. If we have the flum day, obviously we take a lot longer than that, but this is a bite size session. So um, I will now finish the presentation. I'll just close down the uh, PowerPoint. Is there any other questions, folks? Uh, I just wanted to ask a question. It's Jonathan from Carl. Hi. Hi. Uh, ask a question about um, stockings. Okay. Um, you're obviously promoting these hosiery kits quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so is it that you use a hosiery kit whilst they've got a leg ulcer and then convert to a different stocking when they're healed? Or do you carry on with that? What do you do? OK, so um, yes, you can use what, what we're going to be suggesting a lot more is using a leg ulcer hosiery kit while patients have actually got an active ulcer. Um, and obviously, if they've got a massive big circumferential ulcer, that's not going to be possible. But those with smaller ulcers um, where you can get a dressing on and get the hosiery kit over because it, uh, it comes as a liner type, a, a, a sort of liner type of first layer, which is quite on the more stretchy side. So you can get it over a dressing and then a, um, a, a 30 millimeter of mercury outer one. So the two together will give you the 40 that you need that a bandage would deliver. Now, I, I would say that if you've had them in a leg or the hosiery kit, they've been happy in it and um, they've not been in it for that long and you've got them healed. I would keep them in that um, because you're sustaining the 40 millimetres of mercury of pressure, aren't you, uh, with that afterwards. Um, if you step down to a class two, you're going to be giving them less compression. Um, if it's an active lymph, not an awful lot less, but it is less. Um, and, you know, at the point of then needing to renew hosiery, you would have to make a shout as to whether they go into a single layer, class two active lymph, for example, or whether you want to keep them into a leg or a hosiery kit. I think it's all down to your level, your assessment about the the extent of their venous disease. So if they've got masses of venous signs, hemosiderin staining, ankle flare, duh, 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 the whole list. I mean, hopefully they're going to have some venous ablation from vascular, which will sort out that problem and make recurrence less um, risky. Um, but if you feel that, you know, they've got a biggish limb, they've had a lot of oedema, you probably want to keep that compression level higher. So maybe keeping them in the kit might be a better option, certainly shorter term, immediately after you've healed them. I don't know if you want to come in and add to that, Penny. Is she gone? I don't know. She's uh, on. Um, okay. no, no, not really. No? Okay. <laughs> I mean, you, yes, no, I, I, I roughly had an ear on it to know. I have nothing else to say. Okay, thank you. Is that okay, Jonathan? Does that answer your question? So, and there is a, there's a British standard leg ulcer kit and an Actilimp leg ulcer kit, I see. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you would go with as you would be choosing after care hosiery, the presence of edema or previous presence of edema, and um, you would be putting them in the acti lymph version. And you'd be looking to do that unless there was a very good reason not to. Put them so into I mean, a I... kit. Yes, uh, yes. I think I think as we move forward, Penny will be moving this work forward. We are wanting the default to be, if at all possible, leg ulcer hosiery kits. Now, how we get those, because obviously at the moment we have bandages on OMPOS, um, hosiery kits would be an FP10. So there's some political issues to um, resolve first as to whether the kits would be procured. So they would be there available for you to be putting on straight away um, or whether it has to be an FP10 and therefore there's going to be a shift in budgets. But anyway, you haven't got to worry about that at the moment, but we've got some little political issues to sort out beforehand. But but we're hoping that that will be the case, that your default should be 
Um, once you've assessed them as being venous, they would step up to a leg ulcer hosiery kit if possible. Okay. And the good thing about that is it gets them used to hosiery longer term, doesn't it? Yeah. 